This is the AWS News Desk, live from Seattle, with your host, Rudy Chetty. The final keynote of reInvent brought us into a sugar warehouse in Amsterdam. Amazon CTO Werner Vogel shared his vision for technology of the past and of the future. For almost all of us, digital services have become essential. But this means that these services are not just for the digital natives with their fiber connections and the latest smartphones. Consider the experiences you're building for them and how they access them. Not everyone has 5G or even a strong Wi-Fi connection at home. If you build essential services, make sure they also work on low bandwidth, high latency connections. Werner took viewers on a journey through the factory, talking about automation, controls, process, all the key parts of building and maintaining applications. He implored customers to take a look at how they are architecting today and find new ways to make their applications more resilient. Out of all the things we're announcing this year, this is the one that I'm most excited about. The launch of AWS Fault Injection Simulator is a new service for chaos engineering. It allows teams to add failures into an application in order to improve performance and resiliency. This new tool is something customers have been asking for, like the team at Lego who has reimagined their commerce platform using serverless on AWS. It's hard to imagine that we only started our journey to the cloud back in 2017, but time flies when you're having fun, and we've learned a lot along the way. The name Lego is an abbreviation of two Danish words, lie and got, meaning play well. And when play is at the core of everything you do, the learnings and opportunities are endless. Lego's philosophy fits well with AWS's too, that we're all builders. And Werner had some parting words for everyone. It's never been a better time to use your knowledge, skills and talents to make a difference in the world. Now, go build. Turning now to the power of machine learning. You've by now heard that AWS has the broadest and deepest set of machine learning capabilities for developers. The extension of those capabilities into services like databases and analytics tools has the industry celebrating. Reporter Denise Kwashi explains. We are bringing Amazon SageMaker and other ML services directly into the tools that database developers, data analysts, and business analysts use every day. Adding the power of machine learning into databases, data warehouses, data lakes, and BI tools is a bold step, and one that was previously complicated. If you look at Amazon Aurora, it was a multi-step process for developers to get the ML functionality they needed. Last year, AWS solved this issue with Amazon Aurora ML by allowing builders to run a simple SQL query. AWS did the same for Athena, allowing analysts to run inferences for things like forecast sales by invoking pre-trained ML models with SQL queries. This re-event, it continued the trend. I'm really excited to announce Amazon Redshift ML, an integration of Amazon SageMaker Autopilot into Amazon Redshift to make it easy for data warehouse users to apply machine learning on that data. In addition to the data warehousing capabilities, Amazon Neptune ML also launched last week. It enables easy, fast, and accurate predictions for graph applications. But perhaps the most exciting infusion of ML capabilities into a product came for Amazon QuickSight, the business intelligence tool. Now with Q, I can simply type my questions in QuickSight and get answers. Show me last year's weekly sales in California. And Q provides an answer in just a few seconds. Using natural language processing, it allows users to simply ask questions about their data and get answers in seconds. Think of it as Amazon Kendra for BI. Prior to this functionality, if someone wanted to know something specific about the sales numbers, they would likely have to send an email or submit a ticket for BI teams to answer. The great thing is users don't have to pick from a set number of questions. They can type in any question about the data. Amazon QuickSight Q is another way AWS is trying to unburden customers from heavy lifting. In Atlanta, I'm Denise Quashi. Thanks, Denise. Let's go now to reporter Ali Flicker with the follow-up report on this year's database announcements. 
This reInvent, AWS's fastest growing service just got some major updates. CEO Andy Jassy announced the next version of Amazon Aurora Serverless, which can drastically improve cost savings for customers. The new version scales customers' capacity at the precise increments needed. That's resulted in up to 90% cost savings versus when Aurora Serverless is provisioned for peak load. Also, Babelfish for Aurora PostgreSQL lets customers run SQL Server applications directly on Aurora PostgreSQL with little to no code changes. For the more than 100,000 customers already loving Amazon Aurora, these new capabilities are getting five-star reviews. Well, performance is much better than I expected. I think there was some concerns early on, but performance is much better. Uh, additionally, we have less maintenance and support from uh, what, what we're used to from a management perspective. We can focus on the, the features and products as opposed to some of the daily care and feeding of some of the systems. So that's a huge, huge plus for us. Since they started migrating to AWS, customer Best Western says now they can rest easy. In DC, I'm Allie Flicker. Migrations and digital transformations have this connotation of being long journeys fraught with challenges, but many times it goes quite smooth. Here now to talk to us about some huge projects undertaken at AWS is Francesca Vasquez, who is Director of Solutions Architecture. Thanks so much for joining us, Francesca. Thanks, Rudy. It's great to be here. For those of us that aren't familiar with solutions architecture, can you tell us what your team of solutions architects focus on and how AWS's approach is unique or different? Absolutely. So AWS's solution architects, we are a team of builders that work with startups, governments, and enterprises. And ultimately, we try to work with our customers to help them achieve their business outcomes and really help them reimagine their customers' experience. We do this by providing prescriptive technical guidance for them. We help them drive innovation cultures for their organizations. And ultimately, we help them through migrations and modernizations on their journey to the cloud. So I feel pretty lucky to be part of this amazing team. What does a typical engagement look like for your team in solutions architecture? Yeah, it's a great question. It, it varies. It really depends on where the customers are in their journey. So sometimes customers are very much just interested in having an overview about how AWS can help them. Sometimes customers want to dive into deeper architectural reviews and we have mechanisms like our well-architected uh, program and our approach for that. And then other times customers want to be able to have us sit side by side, well, virtually now, and just show them you know, how you'd be able to develop applications or just use the platform. And so we work with customers in a variety of ways, and those are some of the common engagements that I see. Well, can you paint the picture of the trend you're seeing from customers? If you think about 2019 versus 2020, how have the conversations you're having with customers changed? They definitely have changed here in 2020. And I think much of that is being driven by you know, what customers have experienced as a result of COVID-19. There's a few tenets I think are critically important. I think one for every customer in every imaginable industry, digital is sort of the way of life right now. And so we've been able to watch customers really have to transform their business to really align to digital transformation. Two, we believe that many of our customers are also having to operate with distributed teams and much of the work that's being done is all real time now. So we've watched some customers in their industries where business has accelerated and we've had to help them uh, through that acceleration. And then for other customers, I don't speak to a single customer where things like cost savings and cost optimization is important, critically important for them. So those are some of the things that we're seeing at a macro level uh, that were very different in 2019. We've heard about some customers doing big digital transformations, such as Thomson Reuters and Viacom CBS. Can you walk us through those examples? Absolutely. 
Absolutely. I, I think there's so many customers that in order to drive this digital transformation, they first are making the step to migrate to the cloud. And the second thing that they're doing is looking at how they will modernize their applications. Viacom CBS is great. They're a wonderful customer in the media and entertainment space and really driving uh, towards being able to reimagine how they provide content you know, out to their different users, whether that be on a mobile platform or not. And so we've been on the journey with them uh, for uh, quite some time to help them be able to deliver new streaming based services and all of that being powered by the cloud. Uh, in addition, Thomson Reuters has really wanted to reimagine how they provide data as part of their platform. And we've been helping them through migrations and modernization of their analytics platform and their storage platform so that they can create a differentiated experience for their customers. So That's fascinating to hear. And we know that more and more organizations are going to move to the cloud in some fashion. What's the case that you make for doing it now though? I think the case for doing it right now is that one, cost optimization and performance is to some extent non-negotiable. Many people right now who've been disrupted again by the pandemic are really having to accelerate to digital and a remote workforce. And so cost generally becomes the starting point, but very quickly it leads into innovation and modernization of their applications. And customer experience, I think, is one of the areas right now that our customers tell us is critically important for them. So that's what I see. And I hope that we'll continue to be able to provide help for all of our, our customers uh, as they manage through this and change our new, our new normal. Well, you know what, thank you for those wonderful insights. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much, Rudy. It's been great to be here. Build on. Build on. That was Francesca Vasquez, Director of Solutions Architecture at AWS. Now let's go over to Rob across the studio for some partner news. AWS has more than 5,000 SAP customers, and more than half of those customers have deployed SAP HANA-based solutions. It's a growing area. Earlier this month, Siemens Smart Infrastructure announced it was migrating more than 20 systems, all based on SAP HANA, to AWS before the end of next year. To talk about all things SAP, I'm joined by Stephen Jones, Director of Engineering with EC2. Now let's start with an easy question. Why are customers choosing to run SAP on AWS? For customers who are deploying SAP on AWS, they're really looking more than just a hosting platform, right? They, they want a place to innovate, and they're, and they're looking for providers to provide uh, deeper automation. And this has been something that we've we've been leading in for quite some time with quick starts that we developed for SAP starting back in 2014 to the recent launch of Launch Wizard for SAP uh, earlier this year. And this, this brings full automated deployment scenarios for SAP landscapes to AWS for the SAP technical folks, right? Who, if you think about it, uh, sometimes are grappling with what it means to move to cloud and deploy a mission critical workload. We provide these best practices, both from SAP and AWS in an automated way. So that's super important. Uh, is there a specific vertical that uses AWS for SAP? Customers are adopting our platform for SAP workloads span nearly every industry vertical, right? That, that's out there, right? So if you can take, for example, retail, right, with companies like Uniqlo and Zalando in Germany, or healthcare and life sciences with companies like Moderna or Bristol Myers Squibb. We have, we have large oil and gas companies with the likes of P66 and British Petroleum. Uh, in the energy sector, uh, companies like Angie in France, Origin Energy and, and TC Energy in Canada. Uh, large manufacturing companies like Lockheed Martin and Siemens, they'll be migrating a pretty massive landscape of 20 ERP and supply chain systems to AWS all by the end of 2021. So it's it's accelerating, it, it covers all the industries and uh, we're pretty excited about that. Now that's a lot of customers there. Uh, can you also highlight a specific use case? Yeah, you bet. I think Zalando is a really good example, right? So they, they actually migrated their entire SAP landscape to AWS. It includes a transformation to SAP's most recent code line, which is S4 HANA, but they've also integrated with 36 other AWS services. And for, for example, uh, they're leveraging image recognition, right? Uh, that allows them to improve invoice processing, which is helping them actually move and ship 90 million orders per year on their platform. And what about some mission critical workloads? 
you know, the ability to support uh, mission critical SAP workloads is, is something that we've been really pushing the envelope for for quite some time. And it, it's it's allowed customers like the U.S. Navy, who recently deployed their the pretty massive ERP solution in AWS GovCloud. This system supports over 72,000 users globally across six different Navy commands. And they actually estimated for us that uh, about 70 billion worth of parts and goods are actually transacted through this system over the course of a year. So some very large and important landscapes um, are being run and, and, and built on AWS. And uh, and that's that really speaks, I think, to the, the resiliency, the security, the performance and reliability um, that the customers have come to expect. Uh, let's get a bit more technical. What is it about AWS architecture that makes it optimal for SAP workloads? When it comes to SAP systems, performance uh, matters a lot, right? And so customers really do love our nitro powered systems, including some of our large high memory instances for SAP HANA. And what nitro really allows customers to do is to, to access the full raw compute capabilities from a server, right? CPU and memory without having to give up flexible characteristics they expect from the cloud. It, a lot of other providers, uh, bare metal offerings are either hosted in a, a colo facility or have different architecture patterns and aren't fully integrated into a cloud experience. And that's something we just weren't willing to compromise and Nitro allows us to deliver that, that experience. All right, Stephen, thank you very much for joining us. We'll have to leave it there for today. Rudy, back to you. Thanks, Rob, and thank you for watching. While reInvent is almost over, the Newsdesk team still has a pile of stories coming in. Tomorrow, we'll see how some customers are banking on the cloud. Plus, sit down with Phil Potloff. He leads a special team of former CIOs, all working at AWS. We'll find out what they do. That's all tomorrow. I'm Rudy Chetty, AWS Newsdesk, signing out.